Sweet breath. 
Hello, everyone. You may be seated. Father, I just thank you for this evening. I just thank you for just a wonderful time to spend in your word and your presence. There's so much other things that we could have decided to do to not come here, but We know how great you are, and we know how important your message is for us to just take in and apply it to our lives. I just thank you for giving all the opportunity to be here tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. It's nice to see everybody this evening. So all meetings um, going forward will be held here at 505 State Street. So that means Saturdays at 5 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7, and always available on YouTube on Sunday. Um, Kids Church, pre-K three and a half to kindergarten, and first through sixth grade is on Wednesdays. And then we have um, Jesus Pieces Youth Group. Great time for the youth to just um, fellowship and receive a really great message. Um, EPIC is April 21st at 1 p.m. Um, men's meeting is April 26th at 7, and Dunamis is May 3rd at 7.15, and prayer is Fridays at 10 a.m. And now here's Rachel for the offering. Hi, welcome everyone. Hi to everyone online. What awesome worship. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just, we want more of you. We will love your presence and such a blessing. So um, as I was asking the Lord what to, what to speak about for receiving the offering today, he reminded me of my nasturtiums that I'd recently planted. And so we're um, going into garden season. So Rachel will start talking about gardening again. Praise God. Beautiful morning and afternoon in the the yard today. But the Word of God talks a lot about seed and sowing and sowing and reaping. And it's just, you know, for me as a gardener, I do a lot of sowing and reaping. But for those of you who don't, it's it's just a beautiful um, analogy to use to teach us about how, about things. So what, what we do results in a consequence. And those can be good consequences or bad consequences. And um, it starts, you know, the first mention of, of seed is actually very early in the Bible. In Genesis 1, verse 12, it says, um, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to their own kind. So that's a whole cycle that the, the trees come from a seed and then they create fruit and then there's more seed. So it's this whole cycle of multiplication. And then in um, 2 Corinthians um, 9, starting at verse 6, um, and I've used the the message translation, which is a little bit of a fun way of looking at it, but it says, remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give that will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. And who do we know that delights in us and delights in giving to us? Our God delights in giving to us as well. God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws caution to the to the wind, giving to the needy and reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out, never wear out. The most generous God, who this most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. So God is always providing for us. And we can, you know, he provides for us to eat and seed creates food, but it can give you much more. We can, we, he gives us enough to give away. He gives you something then that you can give away, which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God. So as we're giving, it's really making a way for 
for helping others. Like we're giving into the offering today for this church. It helps us to have this building. It helps us to be building the other building. It helps us to, to minister. It helps us to help so many people. They're wealthy in every way so that you can be, can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. Carrying out the social relief work involves far more than helping meet bare needs of poor Christians. It also produces abundant and bountiful thanksgivings to God. This relief offering is a prod to live at your very best, showing your gratitude by, to God by being openly obedient to the plain meaning of the message of Christ. You show your gratitude to God through, grace, through your generous offerings to your needy brothers and sisters, really toward everyone. So it's a real opportunity for us as we give to sow seed. Now, my little object lesson here. Janice kindly gave me some nasturtium seeds a while back, and some of them are in here still, and some of them are in here. Guess which ones I sowed, and guess which ones are going to produce something. So there you go. So it was a really nice lesson and a reminder that you know we're not going to, if we hold on to our seed and keep it in our little baggie, it's not going to produce anything, but this is going to produce something. So I'm excited to, and maybe, maybe we'll be able to use this object lesson later on in a few months when it's actually produced some flowers. But, um, you know, it's a really good reminder to us that, you know, we can, we can have seed and we're all given seed. We've all got seed in our lives, whether that's financial seed, your time can be a seed, your love can be a seed. Like, think about what do you have in your hand that can be a seed? And then how are you sowing it? Are you sowing it at all? Are you sowing it in the wrong places? Our time is is probably, as I was praying about this this afternoon, it's like, wow, where do we spend our time? Are we spending it watching mindless television and playing video games and scrolling through whatever app we're scrolling through? It's pretty easy to just waste and fritter away time, but what if we were sowing it in, in more fruitful soil? You know, just It's such an opportunity for us. So I'd like to um, um, pray for our offering. Thank you, Father, that you are the, the one who gives us great seed. Lord God, you give us seed in abundance, Father. Help us to be wise with that seed, Lord, to know which seed is for us to eat and which seed is, is for us to sow and where to sow it, Lord God, whether that seed is, is finances, whether it's time, whether it's whatever, Lord God, you've given us. We thank you that you are the God of abundant resource. You own the cattle on a thousand hills and we can trust you, Lord God, that as we sow our seed, Lord God, you're going to bring forth a harvest, Father God, but we don't do it for that harvest. Lord, it's a beautiful law and it's a beautiful consequence of honoring you, Lord God, but we give our seed to offer you, honor you, Lord God, and thank you, give you thanksgiving for all that you are, all you give us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So with that, the ushers will be around to collect the offering. Now, you might have noticed that Pastor Tim isn't here, but we have um, a special friend of Pastor Tim's, Pastor Pete, and his wife Debbie here, so welcome to you both. We're excited to hear the word of the Lord from you today. It's very exciting, so thank you. Um, we, don't, we don't often get um, visiting ministry in this church, and Pastor Tim doesn't give his pulpit up to just anyone, so we can trust that, that um, Pastor Pete's going to bring a, a good message in. Uh, Pastor Tim tells me that they, they go back a very long way, so right probably since very early days of Pastor Tim being a pastor, so it's exciting to um, to welcome you. But before you come up, I'd just last, I'd like to pray a blessing over our pastors. Pastor Tim and Leanne are in Oklahoma expecting a, um, I don't know if the, if the granddaughter's arrived yet, but very soon to be born, grandchild number 10 for Elizabeth and um from Elizabeth, and um, yeah, and we'll pray for Pastor Pete as well. Father, we thank you for our pastors, for Pastor Tim and, and Leanne, Lord, and for safe travels for them, Lord. We thank you for all they are and, and all they do, Lord God, for their faithfulness and their trust in you, Lord God, and the, the great example they are, Lord. We ask that you would give them special times this week, week with their family, Lord God. Bless them, bless them, bless them, encourage them. Lord, refresh them in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for the birth of this new, newborn one, Lord God. I pray that she'll come smoothly and all will go well, Lord God. And you'll bless her and you'll bless their travels and all that's around it, Lord God. And we thank you for Pastor Pete, Lord, and for the word that you have in his heart to bring to us today. We ask your blessing on him and on Debbie, Lord God. I ask that you would increase your anointing, Lord God, as they come and sow into this church, Lord God, that they would reap a harvest to take back into their own church, Lord God, that there'd be abundance, Lord God, that they would even as they're coming to 
to give, Lord God, that they would receive, Father God, that they receive more than they ever imagined. Lord God, they didn't come here to receive, but Lord, we, we say bless them. Lord God, pour your anointing oil on them, Lord God, from the top of their heads, running down and overflowing more than they can contain in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Welcome, Pastor Pete. Thank you, Rachel. Praise God. Pastor Tim's wife, Leanne, texted me. She said, Rachel was going to announce me. And I said, well, that's interesting. I've never been announced. I've been denounced a few times. Never been announced. So this is, this is a, a blessing. Praise God. But it's good to be here with all of you. My, from my wife, Deb. Uh, and myself, we're just privileged and honored to be here with you. And again, appreciate Pastor Tim and Leanne so much. They've been just good friends with, you know, with us for many years, as Rachel said. And we've known both of them. And, and just thank God for them and the relationship we have in Christ. You know, that's a blessing that all of us have, to have fellowship with one another, have fellowship with saints, God's people. And uh, we need to take advantage of that, really. And uh, you have some uh, relationships, I'm sure, with some of the others in the body of Christ. I encourage you to, uh, you know, take advantage of that and be a blessing to them and vice versa. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to start today and get into uh, some scripture. Uh, the message today, uh, I'm calling it Living Christ. Hallelujah. Living Christ. And we'll talk about that. And I want to pray first myself, and then uh, we will get right into it. So, Father, we do again thank you for your goodness and love to us. We thank you, Father, that you've given us your Son. You gave us your greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus, who dwells in us now, who is our life, who is our living. And, Father, today we just thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ to us, a deeper revelation and understanding of who he is and all that he's done. And Father, by your spirit, the mighty Holy Spirit, we thank you for revelation, light into your truth, and a blessing upon all that are here now and are listening in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, praise God. As I said, uh, the title is Living Christ. You know, and that takes me back a number of years. When I was an early believer, and I would just start to read the word. I knew nothing of scripture. I came from a religious background, but I didn't know the Bible at all. And so as I started reading things as a, a new believer, I'd come across things uh, in uh, the New Testament, especially that would talk about Christ as our life. And the apostle Paul especially spoke of that when he said that um, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live in Galatians. So I would read that. Then I'd read in Colossians, uh, talking about, as you've received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. Or other verses that would speak about Christ as my life. And I really didn't understand it. And I don't know if you're, how you are with things like that, but at that time especially, I would read these things and just kind of put them to the side. Because uh, I didn't quite understand it. And as years went by, uh, by the mercy and grace of God, by the Holy Spirit, I was starting to get light and revelation of it. And that's something that just goes on and on for each of us. No one, as we know, uh, as the Apostle Paul, uh, Paul said, I haven't appreh apprehended it all, but he said, but I'm going forth. I'm pursuing Christ always. And so, hallelujah, I just pray that this today will give you maybe a better understanding by the Holy Spirit's work of what this means. Because living Christ is something that we've been privileged to be able to do. We've received, as I said, Christ's son, and he is life to us, but he's also living in us, and we need to be living him. And so when we think of God's plan, we can go back before the foundation of the world. His plan was really to gain a people who could express him, who could be his express image, actually, in the sense, as the Lord Jesus was to the Father. To do that, what was he going to have to do? Well, he was going to have to make us, of course, in his image and likeness, 
to begin with. But why? So that he could indwell us. And we know that that was God's will and purpose, his eternal will. Not just to create a man, but to dwell in man, to have that oneness and for him to live his life in us and vice versa, us to live him. So when God placed Adam, we'll say, in the garden, he gave him the opportunity to receive, we know, from the tree of life. Usually when we think of those first few chapters of Genesis, we think of, of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our mind goes to that right away, and we know what happened there. Uh, but when you read it, you realize what God was saying was, Adam, here is the tree of life I've put in front of you. My desire, of course, God's desire was that he would partake of that. Unfortunately, we know what choice he made. He chose to live independent of God, to be his own master in that sense. But God's intent was that he would partake from the tree of life, which really signifies, we'll say, God's life, God himself. It's a really a, a type and shadow of Christ as our life, even back from Genesis. But unfortunately, as we said, we know what what Adam did. But we have been filled with God. We've been filled with his spirit. And that's such a great blessing. And I think all of you probably here would probably raise your hand if I said, are you spirit-filled? You probably would say, yes, I'm a spirit-filled believer. And that's great. That's a fantastic thing. The question is, though, we are spirit-filled, but are we living Christ? Are we living by the Spirit? And that's what I want to especially speak to you today of. So our first passage is going to be from John chapter 6, and I know it's familiar to you, but I want to read these verses. John 6, we'll start in verse 51. It says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Mm. We're going to especially look at that last verse, verse 57. But to begin with, when we read this, we see that the Lord was speaking to the Jews. He was speaking to his disciples well. And he said, you're going to have to eat my flesh. You're going to have to drink my blood. And they were baffled. They were like, what is this man telling us? We don't, this is crazy. This man must be, you know, uh, out of his mind. And for the Jews, this, to hear something like this, especially drinking blood, we know that was taboo for them. But here the Lord Jesus comes on the scene and speaks this forth to them. And the things that he says, he says, He who eats me, he shall also live because of me. Hallelujah. Later the Apostle Paul did say, For me to live is Christ. That was Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But the first portion, for me to live is Christ. You see, that was... One of those verses, when I, as I said, when I'd read it, I'd go, well, what does that mean exactly? And then I would just put it to the side, as I said. But uh, what we see here, as we look at these verses that the Lord Jesus spoke, is he says, he mentions two things especially, eat Christ and live Christ. Eat and live. We have to partake of Christ, we know, every day, every moment, really, to have that oneness, fellowship, union with him, abiding in him, as he says in John 15, in order for us to live. 
You know, you've heard it say, I know I have two people say, well, you are what you eat. Well, God has instructed us to eat Christ. And that may sound funny, but it's really true. The Lord spoke right here. This isn't some uh, metaphor or something. He's saying, you're going to have to eat me. You're gonna, in other words, you're going to have to receive me, take me into yourself to live by me, you see. Just as he lived out of the Father, we live out of Christ. We live out of God. And so this is something we need to make as part of our confession. Now, I know Pastor Tim has taught you well, and I know he's talked to you about confessing the Word of God, speaking the Word. I'm sure you've, he's talked to you that, uh, probably talked to you about that a number of times. And how important we know our words are in our confession. Well, this needs to be made our confession as well. I would encourage you to make that confession that for me to live is Christ and begin to let the Holy Spirit just build that into you, to bring it into your heart, not just something from our head. You know, sometimes as Christians, we have mental assent. You've heard of that. We give to Scripture. We give to things. You know, you'll even hear a Christian say, oh, I know that. You know, <laughs> that's one of the most famous things I, I ever said. I know that. I've heard that for years. Really? Well, are you living it? That's, the, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's true for each of us. But, you know, never, never think to yourself, well, I've heard that, or I've heard this so many times. Every day we know we need a fresh revelation from God. You cannot rely on the revelation that you even had yesterday. You had a revelation yesterday concerning, let's say, something in your life. That's great. But today you need another fresh revelation of that manna, that fresh manna. Can't be old, you see. You can't keep it that, in that sense. Well, I learned that 20 years ago. Well, if you don't have a fresh revelation of that today, which means your union with God and fellowship with him today, then you probably are living on something that's rotten. Not that it wasn't true, but you're living on something that, you know, you learned 20 years ago, and maybe it never even there got into your heart. It could have been just some thought. When I say thought, a mental uh, retention. We've got to have more than that, you see. So make, start making this a confession, a daily profession of faith. For me to live is Christ. Hallelujah. And then begin to ask the Holy Spirit to show that to you, to reveal it. Lord, what, is, what does this mean to me right now? What does this mean today? I guarantee you, God, the Holy Spirit, will begin to give you light and enable you to daily understand that, daily start experiencing it. Because we know with God, everything has to be experienced. That's why the word says, taste and see that the Lord is good in the Psalms. What does that mean? Experience God. You can hear of something all day long. I could tell all of you how great my grandmother's mustacholi was for a minute, for a while. You know, I come from a, obviously an Italian-American background. I could tell you my grandmother had the most fantastic uh, sauce, and she did. But until you taste it, you're just taking my word for it. You didn't experience it. I could say, Rachel, you need to, you really, if you, oh, you'd love my mother, my grandmother's mustard, and she'd say, oh, yeah, well, I believe you. And so, but yet she never experienced it. She has to taste it. We've got to taste the word of God. And you know what that's called? Rhema. We have to go from revelation to rhema. Rhema is when the word is working in your life personally. We'll get into a few more things with that, but let me say this. Going back to the Lord's words here, how do we eat the Lord's flesh then and drink his blood? As I said, to eat his flesh and to drink his blood means we have to receive him into us, and we do that through the word as well, we know, and the spirit. The spirit brings the truth of the word within us. It begins to enable us to see, to know, to receive spiritual understanding. But it's God's word is life to us and our life supply. When you receive Christ, God came into you. Hallelujah. That's a blessing that every 
person has it if they've received Jesus Christ. God comes into your life, we'll say, actually to be your life. Now, the question is, as I said, though, and go back to verse 57. It says, he who eats me, though, shall also live because of me. And so God is looking for us to live Christ. And that's why that phrase, that phrase, it starts to unfold to us. Because otherwise it'll seem strange. What do you mean live Christ, somebody once said? I, you know, I, I, what is that? Well, that's what these verses are talking to us about, you see. After receiving him, then we live by him. In other words, I'm not going to live by myself anymore. I'm not going to live as to what I used to do and what I would be in the natural. You know, it's so easy to live our lives out of the natural realm. You've heard that, I'm sure. But it really is. It's easy to fall back into that. Colossians 2.6 says, as therefore you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. In the Greek, the word walk means to live, to act, to have our being even. That's why with that scripture verse from Acts says, in him we live, move, and have our being. That's what the Apostle Paul mentioned in, in Acts uh, 17. How can we express God, though, to others? whether believer or unbeliever, if we ourselves aren't living Christ and living by Christ. That's, that's something we need to take seriously. If you and I want to express ourselves unto others so that they see Christ, then we're going to have to be living Christ ourselves. We're going to have to be living by him, not out of just ourself, out of our natural uh, inclinations, the things that we think we can do or the things we, we can't do. Well, you know, I'm not really good at that. We can't, you can't fall back on that. You can't say that. You can say, well, I would do it, but you know, I'm really not, that, 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 I'm not good at that. I can't do it. Somebody else could do that. No, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. If you're going to confess that verse, and I it's a great verse, Philippians 4.13, then we better operate in that verse, you see. And therefore, I'm not going to tell somebody, well, you know, I, I just really, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm really not good at that. No, you know, none of us are good at most any of these things, especially when it comes to the things of God, as we know. And in many ways, that's good because we don't, that way we don't rely on self and that's what the scripture brings out. Don't rely on self. We've got to live Christ. Do people see who you are or do they see who Christ is in you? What are you expressing to others? You see, the Lord Jesus was the express image of the Father, as the word says. If you saw, that's why he said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. Can we say that? Can you say, when you see me, to say, you're seeing God? <laughs> Most of us would say, well, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think I want to say that. But we need to. Yes. That's the truth. That's God's way, how he looks at it. Yes. You see? We look at it through our own things. We go, well, I, that, you know, that was the Lord Jesus. I can't do that. No, you can't. But Christ is in you to do it. Christ is your life and living. And if I rely on that, you see, then he's going to be manifested. That's why I say God's intent was to come into man. He didn't just create. He wanted a container, as you've heard that. He needed a container. That's why we have a spirit. So he could come and indwell us and have him living through us, expressing him to the world. That's an amazing thing. Only God can do that. You know, as human beings, we can't do that. I could tell somebody, you know, I, if, if I could just get into you for a minute, you'd know what I, well, yeah, yeah. But we can't do that. But you know what? God can. God can do it. Why? Because he's a life-giving spirit. That's what the scripture says about the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That's from 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Christ uh, as the last Adam, it says, was made a quickening spirit. That means a life-giving spirit. 
and he's in us. He, his spirit and your spirit are one. Hallelujah. We need to live, though, by that spirit, you see, and not anything of ourselves. So the question is, as I mentioned one already, I said, how does a Christian then not live Christ when he chooses to live, as I said, from himself? And we can also live in different ways outside of that. For example, some of us may want to live in uh, good ethics. Well, you know, you've heard, maybe you've heard that lately. You know, a Christian has to have good ethics. It's, it's not about this, or it's about ethics. And I'm not putting down that, but I'm saying, are we to live out of ethics or are we to live out of a person? We're to live out of Christ. He's to be our life. We don't live out of anything, of course, of any human standards, even good ethics. Even that is not living Christ. Somebody says, well, are you trying to tell me that uh, I can be immoral? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> it's not you and I that God doesn't uh, care about you know, us living immorally. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God wants us to live Christ and not anything different, not anything else. So many things can be a substitute. We know for Christ. Good works. Well, you know, I'm, I'm doing these good works. I'm trying to do everything I can as a Christian. What does that mean? That means that really what you're doing is trying to do things from self. You're trying to do it out of your own abilities and power, if that's the case. And usually we know what that is. Usually you'll get frustrated or either fail. And that's what happens so many times to Christians. We fail because why? Because we've been trying to do it, as we say. I got to work harder. You know, I'm trying to be a better Christian. That's not what God wants. It may sound good to some people, but that's not God's way. His way is Christ instead of you. You know that verse from Galatians, as I mentioned, 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me, who gave himself for me. But Paul says there, he says, it's not I, but Christ. There again, what does that mean? That means Christ instead of me. It's Christ living his life through me, not me, you see, not me of my own self. If you're putting in a lot of work and effort and labor and toil in trying to be a Christian, I'll tell you what, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're not living Christ. And that's probably why you're not experiencing God's joy as well. What's better, to let God do it or you try to do it? I'd rather let God do it. Lord, I can't do this. You're going to have to do it. God says, that's what I've been waiting for. Just move over, you know. And God's life comes forth. That's why it's a rest. It's not a labor or, or a work. And we see that in Scripture. We see not only Paul, but the other writers, sometimes the, the, uh, the letters, the, uh, the New Testament letters. You see that what's given to us is not a work, but fruit that's to come forth. Why? Because fruit comes forth from the life in us. Hallelujah. It's not a labor. You know, when I was a young believer again, I made faith. I don't know if you did this, because I, I immediately went from not knowing anything of Scripture into uh, faith teaching. I got saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost at the same time, and then immediately went into faith teaching. I didn't know any Scripture, <laughs> as I said, before that. And here I am, you know, hearing these things and receiving these things. So what happened was, at the very beginning, which can happen, I started to make faith a work. You know, I would hear the word, I'd hear these things, I'd read, I'd go, you know, I'd read books. With some, I'm going to be a faith giant. You ever, I don't know if you ever said that to yourself, or you said, man, that's my thing. I'm going to be a faith giant. Well, you know what? I tried doing that, and it never worked. Never worked. <laughs> Why? Because I was making it a work rather than resting in Christ. You may have heard this, but Christianity is not a big do, it's a big done. The Lord Jesus said, it is finished when he was on the cross. It was all done for us, not you and I doing. That doesn't mean you're not going to do things as a believer, but it means you're going to do it out of 
the rest that you have in Christ, meaning your dependency is on him, you see, not yourself. And then your Christian walk becomes not only joyful, but fruitful and a blessing. You're at a place of rest. You're not always thinking, oh, man, I got to be a little better. I, you know, I seem like I fail at this so many times. I'm going to try harder. Well, Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 7. And if you've read that, you know what I mean. Those things that I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. You know, you go, what is, what's going on? Because Paul was experiencing that. I believe he was trying to do things of his own as well. Good things, he wanted to please God, but what happened was he found that the more he did, the more he failed. And really what that's doing is putting ourselves back under the law. And you don't want to do that, just as he spoke about in Galatians. You've fallen from grace. Why? Because you've gone back to the law. You're trying to do it by works and by merit, by performance, you see. And that's what the Jews were used to doing. So when the Lord Jesus came on the scene and said, you know, all those that would labor are, and heavy laden come to me and I'll give you rest, they, this stuff would just blow their mind, I'm sure. They, weren't, they had never heard anything like that. But we as Christians, we should realize and take that to heart to ourselves. Your walk is a rest, meaning it begins with, first, God wants you to come and receive everything first. All that Christ has done, God says, here, this is what you have. This is who you are. Don't try to be this. Don't try to be that. Just take, receive Christ and let Christ live his life through you. You see, live Christ that's what Paul's talking about. It's not I anymore. It's Christ living in me and through me. Hallelujah. There's a, a, one of my favorite verses, tremendous verse, cr tremendous statement in Scripture is from 1 Corinthians 1.30. We'll put that on. As you can see, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That's a tremendous verse, because really in that verse, you can substitute anything in there as well, other things. By what? Christ is every one of those things to us. Christ is wisdom unto us. He's been made wisdom unto us, you see. He's been made righteousness, sanctification, redemption. It's not a thing. For years, I used to always look at these things and go, well, you know, I need that. I need that sanctification or I need this. Thing. No, these, what it's saying is the person of Christ is every one of those things in, to, in you. Who is wisdom unto you? Christ. Righteousness. Christ is your righteousness. Christ is your sanctification. Christ is your redemption. It's a person, not a thing. It's not some condition. That changes our whole mindset. We begin to go, wait a minute. I'm not trying to get something. I already have it because Christ is, for example, my righteousness. I'm not trying to be righteous. You can put in there, and these are things I would really encourage you with. They've, they've blessed me, and if the if Holy Spirit gives it to you, you take advantage of it. But I'm telling you, you can put in there, for example, health. Christ is your health. What would you rather have, Christ healing you or Christ as your health? I'd rather have Christ as my health. In other words, the person of Christ in me is health to my body. That's even better than getting healed. Why? Because Christ in you is health. He is your healing. It's not trying to get something. See, usually, and I did this for, like I say again, a long time. I got, what are you doing? I'm believing for my healing. Wait a minute. God says, I've given you my son, and he's health in you. Just as he's your righteousness and your holiness, Christ being the person, Christ is your health. Hmm. See, we look at it, for most of us, as being a matter of elimination. Well, if I could get rid of this, I'd feel much better, you know. Or if this, if, I, if this weakness, if this was, you know, uh, if I had the absence, we'll say, of weakness, I mean, I'd, be, I'd be okay. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that Christ 
is your health. So it's not a matter of elimination. It's the indwelling person of Christ in you as your health. It's not, we'll say, the absence of weakness. It's the presence of a vital power, which is the person of Christ. And so what does that mean? That means I don't have to start trying to believe to get hit. All I have to do is say, Father, thank you. You've given me Christ as health in my body. You see, that's when you people, we speak of divine health. That's really what that means. But for years, as I said, I looked at that as being something I had to, well, if I could just get enough faith, if I could just, you know, learn more of the word, if I could, whatever it was, it was always something I had to do. And if I get there, I'll, you know, walk in that divine health. No, you have Christ as your health. Sickness cannot be any place where God is in your body. If Christ is in you as health and healing, and he is, then sickness and disease cannot be there. It cannot stay. It has to go, you see. What a blessing to know that and to begin to exercise my faith in God's word towards that. That changes. To me, it, it made a huge difference in my life. You know, and, and, and I appreciate when people will say things, even now, I mean, once in a while I'll still have someone, whether it's in our church or a person will say, you know, pray for me because I'm, I'm believing for my healing. I'm, and, and I'm not putting anybody down, you know, because that sounds good, but, you know, really, it's not the truth. The truth is, no, it's not believing for your healing. The truth is you have been healed, and Christ in you is health. Christ in you is your wealth. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. That includes poverty. Christ is your wealth. Now, I need to operate in that. If I'm going to believe that, then, then my giving will start to show it, and I can grow in faith. And as Sister Rachel was talking about, you know, planting the seed and things, we always have opportunity to plant seed. And as you do that and you see your faith growing in that, you really start to see more and more that Christ is your prosperity. God, who's the ultimate giver, has given us everything, you see. And so now I begin to, what, sow seed. I sow liberally, if I can't, you know, out of a cheerful heart, as was mentioned. Thank you, Lord. You're my prosperity. I'm going to start sowing my seed because I want to be a giver. You're a giver and your nature is in me. I'm going to live Christ and Christ is a giver. You know, it's as simple as that. It's not you and I trying to be a giver. You know, I, I guarantee you, if you've tried that as well, it doesn't work real good. You'll, well, I'm going to try to give more this year or something. Forget that. Don't, don't, don't put your focus on that. Put your focus on God to say, Lord, you're my prosperity. I'm going to sow, and I know you'll, you're the abundant giver. Every seed will come back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, Shall men give into my bosom? And as you do that, you'll grow in faith and you'll see your prosperity begin to flourish more than ever. But it's not going to be because you're trying to do this, you know. You know, it's like the person, I remember a person, you know, I've tried to tithe. You know, they, they were so, fo I, I tried to tithe, but I just can't seem to do it. I just don't have, you know. I said, don't worry about that. Don't put yourself in a box with that. We even make that a bondage, you know. God wants us to enjoy him and to prosper in everything. Just begin to move by what the Spirit gives you. If he says, sow this a little bit, then begin to do that. If he starts encouraging to maybe to, to give a little bit more, then you can do that. But don't move without his, you know, movement in you. Don't do it without the Holy Spirit's work in that. And then you'll keep growing. In fact, you'll get way past tithing. You'll get to a point where you're giving way beyond tithe, you know, tithe. We don't have to stop there. Sometimes as Christians, we, have, we think tithing is the magic thing. You know, oh, when I get there, that's it, I'm, I've arrived. No, you haven't. God will enable you to be such, be so prosperous, you'll be a giver, a distributor of his wealth to others. You won't, you'll be way beyond tithing. What a blessing to be that way. That's, that's the stewardship we talk about that God has given us, you see. That's Christ in you. That's living by Christ. 
Hallelujah. Let's take something here. I'm going to have to get close up pretty soon. I know that. <laughs> but let's talk about one that usually comes up, two things that come up so easily. Have you ever heard somebody pray, Lord, I, I, Lord I'm praying, I need more patience. Have you ever prayed that? Has anybody ever prayed you need more patience? No. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that's a prayer that won't get answered. Ah, and I mean that seriously. That's not a scriptural prayer. You know why? Because now you're still relying. You think God's going to give me help to be more patient. No, he doesn't give you help to be patient. He is your patience. He is your humility. He is, you can take every attribute and every virtue, and it's Christ. It's a person. It's not something you're going to, you know, a thing or something, a condition you're going to get. Oh, I got to be, I got to be more patient. No, you got to let Christ be your patience. Therefore, you can't fail. You got to let Christ be your humility. Our former senior pastor, you may have heard of his name, Bill Blonde, but he used to say, I've got humility to be proud of. <laughs> You'll get that later. No, but, but you see, Christ is our patience. One of our uh, uh, staff members, he used an example, so I have to use it because it's so funny. He said, he read a thing once that said, in order to develop patience, it said, go and stand in the longest line in the store, and you'll develop patience. So he tried that. Guess what? He got more angry. He got, <laughs> it, you know, it went the opposite thing. You see, that's what we think, and the natural mind says, well, yeah, that, that'll work. Or sometimes you even hear, I'm going to say sometimes uh, uh, suggestions I think they're well-meaning, but sometimes even for Christians, well, do this and you'll build that. Well, no. Live Christ and Christ will be your patience. When you need patience in that, that particular circumstance, you don't say, oh, Lord, give me, give me, help me to be more patient. Just say, Father, you've given me Christ. He's my patience. I'm going to let him do this. I can't. Normally, I would just go goofy here. I would just, you know get angry and storm off, or you would just say, I've had it. No, but Christ's patience is unlimited. And it's like that for everything, every attribute and every virtue. Think of it that way. It's Christ in your life. It's Christ who is to be that attribute, that virtue for you. It's not you even asking God, Lord, give me help. That's what most Christians will say. Lord, give me help to do this. No, it's Christ in you. And he'll do it. He does it. Live Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. You see. And this is, what, this is what I hope by the Holy Spirit will give you a little bit, maybe a little better understanding. This is something we could be talking about for months, really. You could. But just in this time, I just pray that by God's grace and by the Holy Spirit, he begins to show you more things this way. Take some time in your uh, you know, when you're study, and just look at some of, especially uh, not only Colossians, but look at uh, those four books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philipp Philippians, and Colossians. Read those, and then some of the other, you know, as you're reading uh, the other epistles, read those, but be looking for things that deal with that. And I just believe God will give you more and more and open up our, your heart, open up your understanding to what that is and then just say lord thank you that you've given me christ and i know that you've enabled me to live him i'm going to do that i'm going to cast all my care upon you and thank you for this gift you've given me i'm not going to try you know and, and through my willpower i'm not going to try and you know uh gear myself up get myself excited to do i'm just going to live christ i'm going to let him do it, you see, through me and in me. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you that you've given us, again, the greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus himself, the triune one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, the triune God, though. And, Father, we thank you that Christ is that life-giving spirit in us who quickens us in every capacity, who's enabling us to live that God life. And Father, I pray for each one here 
right now, and again, each that may have heard this message, and I thank you for the revelation knowledge that comes from your spirit. I ask you, Father, to give each one here that spiritual wisdom, spiritual discernment and understanding, and enable them, Father, to walk in a greater dimension of Christ, to know him more, and as Paul said, and the power of the resurrection, of the resurrection in them, in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you again for bearing with me. <laughs> and we're, we're blessed to, again, uh, just share some time with you. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. I, I certainly have some new confessions to make. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It's a real blessing. Thank you for everyone coming today, and hi to everyone through the wall, and hi to everyone online. We look forward to seeing you all again next week, and um, for those of you online, if you can make it, we'd love to see you, and one of these days we'll be in a much bigger space. So TBD win, but it's exciting times, it's getting closer and closer. So Lord, we thank you for today, Lord, we thank you for Pastor Pete and the message, Lord God, I ask that you would help us to to chew on it, Lord God, and chew on it and chew on it and get the richness out of it that you want us to get, Lord God, that you, Lord, as we live Christ, Lord, that you are our supply, you are our health, you are our source, you are our all in all, Lord God. We bless you, Father, and we thank you for the week to come. We ask that you guide us and, and lead us in everything we do, Father, to step in the path you have for us and keep us safe in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.